All right, we're back on. Okay, so yeah, we were just talking about um, how come um, a lot of orthodontists don't grab a hold of this, and I think it, a lot of it is the training. Um, I have a, a the that orthodontist that just came in for a two day course. And uh, he said he was completely blown away by what he learned. He's learned more in two days than he learned in three years about the why behind why we have um, orthodontic problems. In orthodontic school, they teach you how to fix things, but the, the, their, their go-to of the why is it's genetic. It's an easy answer. It's genetic, you know, that's, it's, it's the reason, you know, the parents gave it to the kid and that's why it is. The problem um, is that the American Association of Orthodontics has also said that this is a genetic problem. And so there's nothing you can do about it. We just need to go in and fix it. And they have been teaching extraction and headgear and all these different things for a hundred years. Mm -hmm. And if they actually accept their, the why behind this is as far as um, facial growth and development being, um, you know, the tongue is, is a big part of it, but also a big part of this is our, um, our industrialized uh, nation, our food. You know, if, if you look back, um, I, I've been privileged to rub shoulders with Kevin Boyd. And uh, I mean, he has done so much for the, the basis behind why we have a malocclusion and that is really that uh you know a few hundred years ago we decided to get away from gathering our food and eating raw food and we started piling people into cities and when we did that people went to there's great businesses that came about it and our country is um and the world is all about mass producing food that can be easily prepared cooked and is squishy and if you look back at, at the food that um, people ate you know, even four or 500 years ago, uh, and especially the poor people, the rich people had, you know, people that took care of them. And it seemed like it was more of the rich people that had uh, um, malocclusions versus the poor people because the poor people dug up the food and they just chewed it and they used their jaws. Um, and also, you know, four or 500 years ago, we didn't have Western medicine. Mm -hmm. We um, there was midwives, there was people that helped uh, deliver babies. And um, it was interesting that uh, these midwives would keep a fingernail a little bit long and they would reach in there underneath the tongue mm -hmm. and just fix it. It was very common and fix a uh, tongue tie. And, uh, and now we have pediatricians and obstetricians and we have general practitioners and we've got internal medicine and everybody's got to have a paper mm -hmm. that tells them that they can do something. And without a paper, they won't do anything unless there's a paper and a study been done on it. Even if it doesn't make sense, they're like, well, that, I, I, that's okay, it makes sense, but uh, I don't see a white paper, I don't see some double blind placebo based you know, study that says that I can believe this. And uh, when you look back even a hundred years ago, um, uh, Weston Price and John Mew and, and all these different doctors that noticed these things and wanted to you know help change it, it it went against the status quo, mm -hmm. and it, and you know I look at the orthodontic practices today they're they're huge smile mills, and uh, you can make better money probably, um, just pushing 150 patients through your office every day. But if you stop and become a doctor mm -hmm. instead of a tooth technician, and I know this is going to offend a bunch of orthodontists that listen to this, but most orthodontists and most dentists are tooth technicians. We see a problem, we see a cavity, we fix it. Mm -hmm. We see crooked teeth, we take out teeth, we make them straight. And when we, if you want to become a doctor, you have to stop and look at your patient and you have to look and say, why did this develop this way? What is the root cause of why you have a malocclusion? And, um, and, it, and it's a lot more in depth and it takes a lot more time and effort and you have to have more equipment. And, um, and so I think part of it is that uh, the American Association of Orthodontics um, has not endorsed this. Although this is 
I mean, I I went to the AEO's um, uh, supposed white paper meeting um, back in 20, I think it was 2019 in Florida. And it was interesting, they had both sides of the, uh, of the equation there. Christian Guliman was there, the inventor of AHI. And he got up there and says, I wish I never would have invent invented the word AHI because mm -hmm. it's just become a, it's become a insurance thing to insurances to say treat or not treat. And in the same breath, um, he said, quit taking out teeth and expand and grow the jaws. And then they had all these other um, guys that were there that were showing cases of how they'd grown jaws and improved the airways. Well, then they had another group that said, well, here's a retrospective study of headgear. And um, these patients have or don't have sleep apnea, which they're going to the, they're going to the um, extreme of sleep disorders. Sleep apnea is the extreme of sleep disorders. Upper areas resistance is what a lot of, I mean, I would say most of our um, orthodontic patients don't have sleep apnea and they have um, upper airway resistance syndrome. They've got up, small upper jaws, not enough room for their teeth, small nasal airways, um, small lower jaws, and they don't sleep good. Um, and uh, it was interesting when um, they came out with their white paper that said, uh, orthodontics doesn't cause sleep apnea. And I agree with that. We don't cause sleep apnea. When you take out teeth, it doesn't create sleep apnea. It was already there. The <laughs> underdeveloped jaw was already there. The um, taking out teeth doesn't cause sleep apnea. That patient already had an um, underdeveloped maxilla, underdeveloped mandible, um, and uh, taking out teeth didn't help but it didn't cause it. And I've had people that have, you know, being an orthodontist, people say, well, people want to jump on the bandwagon and say, well, orthodontists are causing sleep apnea. No, they're just not diagnosing sleep disorders and they're just treating teeth. And so they're missing the boat on what's really going on um, with a patient. And uh, I mean, I have, I've lectured um, in our, in the state of Idaho and the American Association of Orthodontics found out my topic and sent people to lecture against me. How rude. <laughs> and in the end, all they could do is look back at studies from 20 years ago mm -hmm. that don't really have a basis in what we're doing today. Now, would and you say you're looking at the patient, their profile, their body posture, all of that before you're even looking in the patient's mouth? How they're the breathing? Breath. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you've got to, I mean, when I'm looking at the patient's profile, you know, you, you look at a patient that's got a, an, a, an obtuse nasal labial angle and a very deficient, you know, supported upper lip. Um, and they might be a class one, but they, they, they're bimaxillary retrognathic. You know, they don't have good lip support. Um, in my consults, we rarely talk about teeth. Mm -hmm. um, we, when we do that, we say, okay, you're, you've got this malocclusion, but you've got this upper jaw that's small in width. It's also sitting back. You got a bottom jaw that's sitting back. I mean, 70 to 80% of orthodontic patients are class two. I mean, genetically is the whole world class two or just orthodontic patients? Why do orthodontic patients come to you? You know, um, I had one mom that, uh, she says, you just think that all orthodontic patients have a tongue tie. And I says, well, I kind of have a, a population of patients that come to me because they have problems. Mm -hmm. I, the patients that don't have problems don't come to see me. And so, you know, you, you say, what is the reason for these malocclusions? Number one, it's, um, you know, our industrialized food our soft, squishy food. I mean, I, I look at, uh, I mean, I look at my daughters. I hope they don't listen to this. They're handing <laughs> their kids three, four years old. They hand them these little packages of applesauce and mushed up stuff where these kids don't have to use their jaw. They don't have to use the muscles of mastication. And they just suck stuff into their mouth to keep them going. Um, you know, we're, we're not 
we're not doing a service to mm -hmm. the whole population by having, I mean, you don't have to have teeth to even eat the food. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at most restaurants you go to, if you didn't have teeth, you could gum everything that they give you. Yep. Uh, very rarely do you have, unless you go to a really good steak place where you got to chew the, chew the steak. I mean, most of the foods that you go to eat, they're just soft and squishy. Um, so we've got these very underdeveloped jaws um, compared to people four or 500 years ago. Mm -hmm. And yet we got the same number of teeth. It was very interesting. Um, uh, this, uh, a dentist and this orthodontist were in our, in our course um, we were doing a conference with a, with a parent and her daughter. And, uh, you know, we, we were looking at the wisdom teeth and I said, well, after expansion, um, you're probably gonna have enough room for the wisdom teeth come in. And the parents are like, well, I thought was everybody had to get their wisdom teeth out. Yep. And I said, you know, before I was an airway orthodontist 15 years ago, I sent almost every patient after treatment to go get their wisdom teeth out. And I looked at my treatment coordinator and said, how often do we send a patient to get their wisdom teeth out now? And we, on average, we start about 500 patients a year. She says, five, five wow. to 10. She goes, I can't remember the last time you actually referred a patient to get their wisdom teeth out. Mm -hmm. And usually the only ones that you do are where they're horizontally impacted and they're, they're going to you know, do that. But patients that have those wisdom teeth that are developing normally, you go ahead and grow the maxilla and you get those bottom teeth that are lined up there. Mm -hmm. I mean, out of 500 patients, 1% needs to go get their wisdom teeth out because they just erupted ectopically versus 95% mm -hmm. previously. Now, what's the oldest age you'll put in a fixed expander? <clears throat> About roughly. Oh, gosh, It depends on the patient, but I've had expanders on patients into their thirties. Okay. Okay. And um, my go-to is usually after they're in their early twenties, depending on the body type of the patient, you know, like you, you've got a fine boned, you're not a, um, a big, you know, heavy bone person. Mm -hmm. um, but I've had, I have had multiple um, women in their twenties and late twenties and even early thirties that I've been able to, um, go ahead and go in and expand them and open up enough space for their teeth to um, be in correctly. Um, when I, when I do that, I'm very careful um, because you want to get sutural expansion. And so usually within about two weeks, if you don't see a gap opening up, what will happen is if you see anything like this on those molars, you stop and say, this is not going to work for you. Right. Um, and so we take it out. We let those teeth come back to homeostasis where they're you know, supposed to be. And then what we do is we go into a Schwartz appliance. And with a Schwartz appliance, um, you can do very, very slow expansion. And uh, I um, tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna bring up a patient that I can turn and we can look on the screen right here. Okay. Um, we just took pictures of her the other day. This will blow your mind. Um, let me get hers up here really quick here. And uh, she's in her mid twenties. <clears throat> and when she came to me, she had, and she's okay. She's told me I can use her images on anything and everything. Um, I'll just show you her. Uh, center bite here okay can you guys see that can you see that pretty good in the back here uh, awesome. now we can okay there we go okay so this is how she came to me full cross bites and a class three the only two teeth out of not in crossbite are the two front teeth yep okay and she also guess what she had a tongue tie yeah, wait until you see this thing. Whoa. Okay. She had never touched her lips with her tongue. Wow. That is a tongue tie. <laughs> okay. Why, yeah. did she, why did she have such a super narrow maxilla? That tongue was never that up. Tongue, yeah, it had never touched the roof of her mouth. It never even touched her lips. 
Wow. And on the day that we did uh, her tongue tie release, and I'll I'll bring up some pictures on here. Um, let's see here. We did some buckle tie releases too. Mm -hmm. I guess these are the previous. These are the these are her buckle ties and stuff that she also had. Um, but on the day of her tongue tie release, we released some buckle ties up there, mm -hmm. and there's her tongue tie release. Um, on that day, when we released that thing, she just about came out of the chair with excitement because her tongue touched her lips. Wow. For the first time. Amazing. Okay. Now, when we look at her, um, I'll pull up a scan of her here real quick. And we just got these pictures on Friday because we had that in-office course where uh -huh. uh, um, these guys are here and I wanted to show them you know, a, a really what I call my super awesome compliant patient. <laughs> and so um, this was her width of uh, her maxilla when we started. And I think she's um, she's about 28.7 millimeters across um, right there uh, between. And where we measure is on the lingual right at the CEJ of the lingual mm -hmm. of the uh, upper six year molars. Okay, this is her bite. You can see how narrow she is. Yeah. Okay. And then let's jump to just the other day. She's in braces. Wow. And she is, um, she's still got a slight crossbite just mm -hmm. on the very back molars. But I'm going to go ahead and bring up her intraoral scan. Remind me, I have two questions that I want to ask you. Okay. Don't let me forget. All right. You can throw them at me here. No, no, no. Let's do this first and then we'll do that. Okay. All right. But this will be cool to see the size of her jaw um, afterwards. Okay. Now the width of her palate is 35.1 millimeters. She's 28.7. So we've got at least six and a half millimeters of growth. Wow. And we don't have flaring of her teeth. Yep. And that's the thing that, that orthodontists will say, well, you, you just flared the teeth out. Uh-huh. So you look at the size of this palate right here, and we went from 28.7 to 35.1. We got six millimeters of growth. And that's now, incredible. before she was a class three, now she's a class one. Uh-huh. And yeah, we still have a, we've, we just put, um, we just took her out of uh, um, uh, you know, a TPA last month. And so now she's just working on elastics to pull things together. But guess what her sleep apnea is? Gone. Non-existent. <laughs> it's gone. And so that's, that, that's it's like, okay. Now, so one now, of my questions is relevant to this. Be prior uh -huh. to, or let me actually, let me rephrase, rephrase that question. In orthodontic school, mm -hmm. what are you taught to expand to a certain amount? Do you talk about millimeters? Do you? No. Okay. It, it was only it was only taught. Um, here, I'm going to pull this this one right here. Okay. Wow. You, the narrowness of that jaw right there. Wow. And where we are here, non-surgically. Mm -hmm just with a Schwartz appliance and granted she was a great patient right incredible absolutely and, incredible and she's 27 years old um and I was told in orthodontic school that by the time you're 16 years old that uh you are um you're done growing mm -hmm. I don't agree with that anymore. Yeah. Anymore. And so um, anyway, so that right there is just, that's just wicked cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very much so. Um, so when, that was one of, that one of those patients. That was my... One of my questions was about the uh, transverse measurement. If it's typical for orthodontists to really be 
concerned about it getting you to a certain number. So, okay. So then let me ask one more question before I ask my final question. It, traditionally speaking, what is your gauge then? Like expand until what? Well, um, oh, there's been some different research out there. Um, and, uh, you know, I think a lot of it comes back from Kevin Boyd and, and uh, Ann Evans. Oh, uh, Marianne Evans, yes. Marianne Evans. You know, I think them together, they looked at stuff and, and uh, I could be wrong on where the numbers come from, but, you know, an average of 38 to 42 millimeters measurement on the, the lingual of the um, six-year molars is where a standard normal um, mm -hmm. transverse dimension should be. But like tra traditionally speaking, orthodontists. There was never, there was never any. So like, but like, how do you know when you've expanded enough? Like what, you're just out of crossbite? That's what we were taught. As soon as you're out of crossbite and the teeth fit together, you're good. And see, I, um, on my patients, especially all these kids, these hundreds and thousands of kids that I've treated, I use the rhinometer as my gauge of when, you know, where they're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, nobody's used an instrument like the rhinometer, um, like I have. Now we've got some other docs out there that are uh, jumping in and they're using some different appliances that I'm using, which is great because then we'll be able to collaborate our data together right. And, you know, whether you use a Schwartz appliance or an Everly expander or a Hyrax expander, mm -hmm. um, I had this um, doc that was in here um, at this course and she's using, oh gosh, what was it called? Um, it's just a wire. It's not quite a quad helix, but uh, um, it's, it's something else that does some expansion. Uh -huh. And I told her, and she's got a rhinometer and pharyngometer in her office. I says, go home and use it. She goes, well, yeah. I, it sits there and collects dust because we don't know how to use it. Yep. So we taught, we taught her how to use it. And I said, get the data on your patients, you know, before you start, when you're here. And uh, what, what we did is I looked, I did a huge literature um, study on where craniofacial growth and development should be at different ages. Mm -hmm. And um, out of that, there's a certain percentage of craniofacial growth and development that happens by the age of two, by the age of four, six, eight, 10, 12. Mm -hmm. And by the time you're 12, 13 years old, your max cell is pretty much set, going to be where it's mm -hmm. going to be. And so um, what I did is uh, I took the standard of um, six um, uh, or 0.6 um, centimeters squared or six millimeters uh, as your cross-sectional area, that's your normal finished um, optimal result of a patient. And then I extrapolated from that down um, to the percentages of facial growth and development and said, okay, well, if six millimeters is normal here, by the time you're two years old, you should be at this level. By the time you're four years old, you should be at mm -hmm. this level. And so, you know, I'm not expanding a kid at four years old and trying to get them at a 12 year old. I'm just trying to get them at a four year old level. Right. So that, you know, now that we've got them there, they can continue and we get right. that tongue function correctly. They can continue to grow mm -hmm. um, better from yeah. here on out. Um, and same, same with the, uh, um, you know, the volumetric measurement. That volumetric measurement is huge. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, cause it's like, you're looking at the nasal valve, but you got to look at the turbinates and, and everything else that goes on beyond that. And so, you know, it's one thing to get the cross-sectional area, but if you don't get the volume, they still can't get enough air in there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so knowing where a kid should be mm -hmm. by a certain age, by six or seven years old. And it's interesting, you know, I had a consult, um, during our, uh, um, our two day course. And um, this little girl was, was about nine years old and she had a class two crooked and crowded teeth. And mom said, well, I said, what is your main concern? She says, well, the teeth just don't look good. Mm. And I just want her teeth to be pretty. And this little girl was on the chair and over here and she was over there and she's over <laughs> here. And, she's back and, forth. And, uh, and so when we started talking about airways and I said, you know, there's so many kids that are misdiagnosed misdiagnosed with ADD and ADHD, 
And I said, a kid that is sleep deprived and is a mouth breather and snores mm-hmm. has a lot of the same symptoms of ADD and ADHD. And she said, she looked at me and she, you could see the bread, blood just drain out of her. Yeah. She goes, we just put her on medicine for ADD a month ago. Yep. And I, and I looked at her and I said, let's pray that. And she, and she had, she had all these things. She says she doesn't sleep through the night. She's, um, she's got all of these different problems, you know, mouth breathing and, and attention span and everything. I said, let's pray that in a month of expansion, that, uh, maybe we can reconsider and talk to your doctor about not having her on this medicine. Mm -hmm. And mom just kind of melted there. And she's like, it was such a hard decision to put her on this medicine, but she was out of control. Mm -hmm. Um, And so uh, I'm super excited to treat this little gal. Yeah. We'll Um, have to have you on for round two when we have a little bit more information on how she's doing with her expansion. (laughs) Uh, mom was super, um, super excited and, and, uh, but I see it all the time. I have a family of five that all the kids are on medicine and Mm -hmm. in six months, none of them are on medicine. Now, let Um, me ask you, so this is my final question because I feel like people can get on the, um, lingual frenum tongue tie release bandwagon and understand why it's important and how it impacts you know, growth and development and tongue function and so forth. But from an orthodontist perspective, especially, I'd love to hear your thoughts on your concern with lip ties and buckle ties orthodontically. I'm not, I'm not convinced that the lip ties and the buckle ties are, have a big influence on, on things. Um, I am, I'm convinced that the tongue, uh, because the tongue has the biggest influence on it. Um, you know, when I think the, the lip ties on babies is huge. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we release, I'm, I'm not a big baby um, tongue tie and lip tie guy, but I think we probably treat a hundred babies a year. Okay. I know the guys that, that treat a thousand, um, but the moms that come in with those babies that have the lip ties, and we release it and all of a sudden that baby can flange its lip up and they can get a better latch mm-hmm. and the pain goes away with the mom. I think those are really important. And then, you know, lip ties that go down there and, and I think you, you can have lip ties and buckle ties that inhibit bone growth and development just if it goes right down onto the ridge and, and prevents um, things restricts from moving. Restricts everything, yeah. It restricts everything. Um, I don't release a whole lot of buckle ties, but I do release a lot of lip ties. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the diastomas that you see these kids come in with, those are, um, you know, those are huge. And, uh, you know, you release them whenever you can so those teeth can come yeah. in correctly. With a CO2 laser, it's amazing. You mm-hmm. can do so much with um, uh, a CO2 laser that just evaporates the tissue and you, um, you know, put a, put a plug in for the kind that we use. We use the light scalpel, which is really, really good. Um, I know there's different ones that are out there, but uh, we've been super pleased. We've had it for about four years. It's, it's I don't, I don't get any money by saying anything like that. I'm not on, I'm not on any type of thing with, I don't have any, um, you know, there's no financial gain by doing it. I just, you know, what we use is amazing to help these people out. Um, Yeah. Dr. Christensen, this has, go ahead. What were you going to say? I'm going to say, but getting that tongue to function, you know, I have parents all the time that when we're done, they, you know, I said, okay, now, um, cause we don't do the tongue tie until after we take an expander out because yeah. a lot of the expansion, I mean, a lot of the follow-up um, and the myofunctional therapy, they've got to be able to push that tongue into their palate. And so we wait until that comes out. And I have parents who are like, well, do we really need to do this? And I said, you know, that's up to you. I says, but if we don't do this, your kid's going to have to wear his retainer for the rest of his life. Yeah. Um, you just went through week. all of this work. <laughs> yeah. And so um, your kid's going to have to do this or else the tongue's going to have a low tongue posture and you're going to have this relapse. Yep. And, uh, and so, um, but I've got a couple of great myofunctional therapists that I work with that's that awesome. really have it down. 
Um, I didn't, there was not a malfunctional therapist within a hundred miles of Lewiston mm -hmm. um, four years ago. Wow. And I did a We're presentation. growing. We're growing. <laughs> They're so critical to my, the success of what I do. Um, especially yeah. with our adult patients, you know, mm -hmm. I have, I have adult patients that, you know, we've done the Schwartz appliance and we've grown their jaws and we give them a lot of tongue space. And then we get a little bit of improvement in their sleep apnea. And then the myofunctional therapist steps in and gets that tongue to function. And all of a sudden we go from 30 AHI down to five. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, I, I'm, I'm insignificant. I love my myofunctional therapist. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all love you for saying that. This has been so enlightening. Honestly, this is probably one of my favorite episodes that I've done. Um, and I think this is number 70 or 71, something like that. This is great. I cannot wait to get it out to everybody. So thank you so much for sharing everything, for being such a trailblazer with everything that you do. You know, your passion definitely just shines through listening to you and everything. It's just so great to, to know you and be a colleague of yours. And yeah, I'm just super excited and thankful that you, you came on tonight. So thank you for your time. Well, you're welcome. I guess we're both on faculty with uh, Airway Health Solutions and trying to spread the word throughout the world. We sure are. Go AHS. Absolutely. Yeah. Everything that, you know, Lauren and Dr. Morali are doing with AHS and just spreading the awareness so that more and people, more people know that there are options out there for them to live healthier, better, full quality lives and not have to take mediocrity for an answer. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me. And I, uh, I'll be glad to help you any way I can. Thank you. All right. Good night.